God. Before we jump into the Word of God today, I have one quick announcement that I want to tell you guys about. And it's about Love Phnom Penh. How many people are excited about Love Phnom Penh? Yeah, it's going to be a great time. Um, for everybody who's wanting to uh, be a part of Love Phnom Penh, that's the Franklin Graham Crusade that's happening uh, next month. We ha we're having training for it uh, the 15th, which is Friday, I believe, right? Is that Friday or Saturday? Friday. Uh, so that'll be from 5.30 or from 6 to 7.30 here at the church meeting room. And what it is, it's training for all the people who want to be part of the altar call team. And so it's not just something that is for one event only, but it's something that will help you, uh, whether you're, you know, praying here at the altar for people on, you know, at the end of Sunday services, or you just want to be a part of what God's doing. If you want to be an altar call worker for the Love Phnom Pen, you have to go through this training. They're not just accepting anybody, but they're, they want everybody who's going to be part of the altar call team to um, come to this training, receive their training. It's, there, there's even a little bit of coaching, how to counsel, how to connect with people uh, during that training. But the goal of it, and I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to a Billy Graham crusade or Franklin Graham crusade, but what it is is the personal connections that are made at the altar call during the Franklin Graham crusade are something that you can continue as we lead people into uh, salvation. And it's almost the beginnings of a discipleship. So when you go to the front and you pray with people during the, the Love Phnom Penh, you make that connection with people and you say, okay, why don't you come to my church this coming Sunday? That's the goal of it. The goal is not to get people into a certain church. It's to get people into every church. Every person, every church who is connected with a Love Phnom Penh festival is encouraged to send people to this altar call worker uh, training so that we can make those connections, make those friendships with people, and lead people into a discipleship, lead people into a church. And so we want to encourage as many people as can come out to that, uh, that to, to join that. That'll be the 15th uh, from 6 to 7.30. And I know, you're got, I know you guys are going to be blessed, you guys are going to be equipped, and God will use you, uh, not just in the Love Phnom Penh Festival, but in... Uh, in the future, making connections with people as well. So, please come on out to that. So, we've been in a series about peace. How many people have enjoyed the last few weeks talking about peace? We've talked about peace, the definitions of peace, the shalom peace that God has for us in body, soul, and spirit. We talked about how we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross so that we can have access into the presence of God. Today we're going to talk about peace within ourselves. We just talked about Franklin Graham. His father, Billy Graham, said there's three types of peace. Peace with God, peace with others, and peace within ourselves. We've talked about peace with God the last couple of weeks. Before that, we had a big, long series about relationships that was revolving around peace with others. Today we're going to talk about, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about peace within ourselves. Everybody say that with me. Peace within ourselves. All right. Let me kind of switch gears a little bit. Uh, I don't know, you know, if people consider me romantic or anything. I don't know if my wife considers me romantic or not. But uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, I uh, posted on Facebook, and you know I don't normally do a lot of stuff like this, but I posted something on Facebook, and I just want to read it. I don't know, it's something that I, you know, kind of thought about, something I wanted to share with my wife, and uh, she didn't know I was going to do this, uh, this this afternoon, but I already put it on Facebook, so it's not like it's something that's, you know, private, it's all out there for the world to see, good or bad, so... Anyways, here we go. So this is what I wrote. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I said, Angie, I love the word together. Everybody say together. 
together. So I love the word together. It's one of my favorite things. I love our relationships. I love our little rendezvous together. I love sharing our likes and dislikes together. I love dreaming together. I love our memories together. I don't exactly like worrying together, but it beats doing it by ourselves. I love praying together, trusting together, and all of the other togethers that come every day. We can't ever know all that the future holds, but as long as it has together in it, we can do it. Thank you for all of the togethers. And, yeah, I mean, it was just something that kind of came from my heart, and uh, I think it's, you know, good for us to do, share our, our, our love for each other and stuff. But, you know, ever since I, I wrote that, I've just been kind of thinking about it. And the truth is, there's another together that's even deeper than a husband and wife relationship. And that's the together that we have with God. The heart of that, what I wrote, it comes from a heart of, you know, I don't know what we're going to face in the future. I don't know good or bad. You know, we have the marriage vows till death do us part, you know, for better or for worse, all that sort of stuff. But the heart of it is saying, I'm glad I got you. I'm glad that we're together. I'm glad that no matter what we face, we're going to do it together. But I began thinking about that, that and even uh, a marriage relationship, you know, there can be stuff that happens in a marriage relationship that, you know, honestly, you know, it can be broken up by death. You know, like I said, I don't know what hap would happen tomorrow, disease, death, any of that stuff. Sometimes it can break that togetherness. And God forbid that would happen, but there's a possibility that I could lose my wife. And then I wouldn't be together with her. I mean, I'd see her when we go to heaven and stuff, and thanks be to God that we have that hope. But honestly, I would be heartbroken if something like that happened. But there's a together that's deeper than the love relationship between a husband and wife, and that's our together relationship with God. And just like we have these together, this together poem, God says the same thing to us. We can say the same thing to God. That, God, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. I don't even know what's happening today. Sometimes we don't even know what's happening five minutes from now. But God, you're there. You're there. You were there in the past. You're here with me now. You're there in the future no matter what happens. You know, when we become Christians, it doesn't put us in a, a bubble that protects us from every sort of difficulty, every problem out there in the world. No, we still get hit with some stuff. But when we have God with us, when he's our together, when he's together with us and we're together with him, boy, oh boy, that's powerful. We can say, God, I'm with you. We sang about it. You know, we don't know what the future holds. I don't, we don't know kind of what's coming, but God, you're my shelter. You're the one that I run to. You're my hiding place. You're the one who covers me like you cover, like a, like a mother hen covers her chicks, protects. God is our God, amen? This is peace. This is peace that no matter what comes, we can look to the future and say, God, boy, wow, I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but I know you're there. I know you're there. And so we can go boldly. This, this journey that we live, it's not... It's not something where God says, hey, you know, you become a Christian and, you know, I'm going to arrange every situation in your life just so you can just kind of walk easily and smoothly. No, we have our ups and downs. We have rocky paths that we travel on. Sometimes it's a, kind of a, an up and down. Sometimes it's we got a, you know, a narrow bridge. We got to tiptoe across. We're not sure. God is with us. God is together with us. And this is peace. This is peace. You know, we sang that song, 
sang a couple songs today. God is our refuge. God is our hiding place. God's the shelter. He's like, he hides us. And as we were singing, I was reminded of two stories in the Bible. Two stories in the Bible. The first one is when, Mo, sorry, when Noah went into the ark. He said, God said to him, he said, everybody go into the ark. God said to Noah, take yourself and your wife, your three sons and your three daughter-in-laws, and go into the ark. Eight people in the ark. So they went into the ark, and God closed the door. But God said to them, he said, don't go outside the ark. If you are outside the ark, I'm not responsible for what happens to you. Just stay inside the ark. That's what God said. Basically, he's saying, just trust me. Stay in the ark. Trust me. The same thing happened in uh, Exodus chapter 12. The, the Israelites were getting ready to leave uh, Egypt, and it was the very, very first Passover. God gave Moses all of the commands, take the sheep, dip the, you know, dip the hyssop in the blood, and put the blood on the, the door frame, and stay inside the house. Don't go outside the house. And so God said to them, he said, the destroyer is coming, but you are to stay inside the house. Basically, he's saying, trust me. If you're inside the house covered by the blood, so much symbol symbolism there. If you've never studied uh, Exodus chapter 12 and compared it to the, the story of, of Jesus, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing study. But basically... God said, you stay inside the house, stay under the blood, trust me, and I will protect you. No harm will come to you. No harm will come to you. Peace with God has a lot to do with trust. Peace with God has a lot to do with trust. You know, sometimes we want to be like that little chick that runs away from the mother hen and says, I can get away, I can get away from this, and I can run and I can do it myself. And no, 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 no. The mother hen just kind of runs after them, rounds them all up again, stay under, stay under the wings, stay under the wings, pr protect. God wants us just to trust, but stay together with him. That's what's so powerful about trust and peace with God. We can have that peace with God when we stay close to him and we stay together with him. I want to read a couple of verses. John 14, uh, verses 1 to 4. This is a couple of the verses that we've been uh, talking about for the last couple of weeks. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples on the night that he went to the cross. He says, don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. That where I am you may be also. Think about those words. The creator of the universe. Jesus himself says that where I am, you may be also. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to all of us that where he is, we can be also. What a place to be. And you know the way to where I am going. John 14, 27. So he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. So there's a part of it that's our responsibility too. As we can see right here. Jesus doesn't just say, okay, I give you peace. Okay, I give you peace. He's saying... Trust me. 
let not your hearts be troubled. It means we got to protect our hearts. It means we got to say, okay, heart, okay, calm down, have peace in God, remind ourselves of the truth of the word of God, and take peace in God. Find peace in God. Trust in God. The peace within ourselves is based on the peace that God gives us, but there's a responsibility that we have as well. The work on the cross, that's already been done. Jesus took care of that. He opened the way, tore the veil, made a way for us to come in, but it's our responsibility to say, God, okay, I trust you. Take that big breath and say, God, all right, I trust you. When the destroyer is outside the house, I'm going to trust the power of the blood. I'm not going to run to my neighbor's house. I'm not going to try and get away or run down out of the city. Or No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay. I'm going to stay with my heavenly Father who loves me together. That's where God wants us. He wants us together with him. You know, Luke said earlier, he said, the older I get. And I'm like, yeah, we're getting older, aren't we, Luke? <laughs> the older we get, we see God's faithfulness more and more. We see his goodness more and more. We see the ups and downs, but boy, we see the sustenance of our Heavenly Father, the sustaining power of our God. And the peace that comes in staying close to Him, we see that this Christian life is not God promising to keep us safe all the time in a little bubble. But he's, he's like, no, I'm going to walk you through this. It's going to be an adventure. There's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be crises. There's going to be difficulties. But no, I'm with you. I'm with you through all of it. You know, who wants to read a novel about... Just somebody just kind of, oh, yeah, he's having a leisurely stroll. How many people, I, I, I'm not a big novel guy, but I've read The Lord of the Rings. I've read uh, um, Chronicles of Narnia. There's some good stories in there, but it's never just a walk in the park. That would be boring. Who wants, who wants to read something like that? Yep, he walked for days and days and days, and nothing happened. Oh, yeah, awesome, fantastic. That's not a fun, really, really a fun story to read. It's not a New York Times bestseller, that's for sure. What, he's, what, what we want is a little bit of adventure. And, you know, sometimes we'd rather wake up on a day and say, God, I, I, I don't want any adventure today. But the truth is, God has adventure for us. Let's think about it as an adventure. And let's embrace the ups and downs because our God is with us. Amen? Our God is with us. We know how this story is going to end. And we don't know what happens between A to Z, but we know that we win in the end. We know that we win in the end. Let's let it be an adventure and let's embrace the ups and downs. But the most important thing and the only way that you can do it is by staying together and staying close to our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. That's the way that God has for us. All right. Another verse that Jesus said to his disciples. All right. Uh, let's go to... Okay, this is when Jesus sent out his disciples. Okay, so Jesus died. He rose again. And this is the end of the Great Commission. We know the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world preach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20, teach them to observe all that I have commanded, commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. 
even to the very end of the age. I am with you always. He didn't tell them all the difficulties that were going to happen. He didn't tell them how some were going to be, you know, tortured and martyred and all this sort of stuff. He didn't tell them all that. But he said, I am with you. I am with you. Your God is with you. That's enough to rejoice. Amen. That's enough to lead us into peace. Your God is together with you. But we need to take heart of that every single day. We need to realize that my life is not our own. Our lives are not our own. Our lives are in the hands of the living God. That is good news. That is good, good news. The next verse, Psalms 23. All right, Psalms 23, we talk about it. It's interesting, there's six verses in that psalm. Two of them are two-thirds, or let's see, two-sixths, one-third of the whole thing. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Ouch. God, can we just avoid that valley, please? I don't really like that one. Just keep me in the, uh, just keep me where the, uh, the, the streams are, the flowing water, the nice grass. That's where I'd rather be. No. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, that's uh, the shadow of death. Death is right there. The shadow of death is right over you. But I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You are with me. You are with me. God is together with us. Take heart. Trust. Remind yourself. This is faith. This is faith. Faith is reminding ourselves of the truth. We look at a mirror. Say, hey, you, remember this. God is with you. God is with you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd rather have a table set up somewhere safe, far away from my enemies, please. Uh, let's keep. No, God says, even in the difficulties, in the presence of your enemies, there will be communion with God. You can partake of, what, of the good things that God has for you. This is the truth of God's provision. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. These are God's promises. But it's the reminding that we are together with God each and every day. All right. I got three points. That was just the introduction. I got three more points. All right. That was a good one. Uh, together. Second one. The last three are based on some writings by C.S. Lewis. When I was a teenager, I wanted to fly F-14 Tomcats off of aircraft carriers like this one in the middle. What you're looking at here is a U.S. Navy aircraft battle group. Okay? So right in the middle, the big ship in the middle is a, it's probably a Nimitz-class carrier. Yeah, probably, probably Nimitz. It's hard to see. But then there's all the other uh, escorts and destroyers and uh, all the different ships that travel with the aircraft carrier. So the carrier doesn't go by itself. It's too valuable to be lost by itself. So it, it travels with, in this picture, in this, in this battle group in particular, there's 14 ships that travel together. And uh, we would call it a fleet uh, the Navy calls it uh, a carrier battle group. So C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis uses an illustration of a ship traveling in a fleet. Okay? And so each one of us is like one of these ships. But there's three things that we're responsible for. Okay? First, we're responsible that our own ship is running well. We got to make sure we have gas. We got to make sure our engines are good. We got to make sure that every, all of the components of the ship are running well. 
So we're, we're, we're responsible for our own ship. Secondly, we're responsible not to bump into the other ships that are around us. We need to make sure we're going in the same direction. Because if one of these ships kind of veers off to the right, I don't like going straight anymore. I think I'm going to turn right here. Okay, he goes and does that. He's not going to cause just damage to himself, but he's going to cause damage to the other ship. And possibly the whole carrier group is going to be delayed. And as you can see, they're sailing pretty close to each other. It could be two, three, four of the ships in that fleet that have accidents that, and then they would all have to go to some place to get fixed. So they're responsible that their own inner workings are going well. They're responsible that they maintain a course which is in line with all of the other ships around. And thirdly, they're responsible for where they ultimately end up. Because, yeah, it's true that someone else makes the decision about where all of these ships go, but if you're traveling in a fleet, you need to make sure that the fleet is going somewhere that you want to go to. So we're responsible for our own ship. We're responsible not to smash into the other ships beside us, but then we're also responsible for the ultimate destination. And this is kind of a, a picture of our own spiritual lives as well. Okay, we're responsible for making sure that we get to the final destination, faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, so that where Christ is, like the verse we just read, Jesus said, where I am, you can be also. Okay, so faith, if we believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Okay, we're also responsible for how we treat those around us. Okay, we talked a lot about that in our relationship series. But we're also responsible for our own inner workings as well. We're responsible to not just be a saved person, but to be one of those people that's a disciple of Jesus and following close to God in everything that we do. So, I have a few points here that I think will be helpful. I hope they're helpful for us to think about in terms of our inner peace within ourselves. We talked about being together with God, how important that is, and how important it is to have that intimate relationship with God on a daily basis. I talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, or last week, I talked about um, Mr. Chesterton. We talked about him and the guy who said, I miss Jesus. He turned away from God for so many years, but he finally near the end of his life, said, I miss Jesus. I don't want you to ever, ever have to say, I miss Jesus. Meet up with him on a regular basis. Going through the good, be with him. Going through the bad, be with him. Be with him every single time. Even, this, is a, this might sound a little bit crazy, but even when you sin, get back to him as soon as you can. Just say, God, what's going on inside of me? I need you. Come on. Make, it, make your life as intimate as you possibly can with God. Spend every moment that you can together with him. My next point for having peace within yourself is God has forgiven you. You need to forgive yourself. It sounds kind of weird, but it's true, and it's something that I think we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. I remember as a teenager, one of the big things that I suffered through a lot with was condemnation. Condemnation. I would always be reminded of my past mistakes and my sins and all that sort of stuff, and I thought, man, I'm, God doesn't, he can't can't love me. I've sinned too much. I've gone too far. Just condemnation after condemnation. If, if Satan can't keep you away from God, and, and if he can't entice you with sin so that you're just living away from God, and you come 
to God and say, God, I want you, I need you, I confess, I want to be a Christian. Satan's next strategy is to bring condemnation into your life and make you feel that you are defined by what you have done. That's what he wants to do. And for so many Christians, we live so long in condemnation. But this is what the Bible says. We know what John 3.16 says, but do you know what John 3.17 says? It says John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think these verses ought to be combined so it's all in one. John 3.17 says, for, Jesus, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God does not want condemnation in your life. That's not his plan for you. God doesn't want you to, oh, woe is me. I'm a Christian, but boy, I have got bad stuff, and I'm a sinner. And Okay, we need to be realistic about our sin. We need to, you know, take it seriously. But we have a God who loves us, and we have a Savior who has made the way already. So, condemnation is not from God. Satan... Let me get this right. Satan names us by our sin, but God names us by his son. Jesus made the way that we can stand before the Heavenly Father. He took our place so that we can take his place before the Heavenly Father. He took our place, he took our sin, so that we can come boldly into the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. This is the promises of God. So we don't need to think, oh, God hates me. I can never. No, forgive yourself. God's forgiven you. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9 says that God is faithful and just. It's not like God or somebody's twisting God's arm saying, oh, you got to forgive him. You got to forgive him. No, no. The price has been paid. It's a legal thing. It's a legal transaction that has taken place. Jesus paid the price so that we can have freedom. The price for your sin has been paid. Trust it. Forgive yourself. Find peace in the cross of Christ. Martin Luther, this is one of my favorite quotes. I shared this a while back. Martin Luther says, when I look at myself, okay, so it's all about perspective. When I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost. When I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look at Christ, wow, <laughs> look at what Jesus did. I can't be lost. I can't be lost. The price has been paid. All right. So let that propel you into peace. Let that propel you into the adventure that we have with God. I have a bunch of verses from Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm not going to read them, but I'd like you guys to go back and just read Ephesians chapter 4. Because God cares about our character too. Okay, we're not going to put them up on the slide. God cares about our character. He wants us to be mindful of our character. Because the truth is, some of the things that we do in our life contribute to us not having peace. If you're wasting all your money, just spending it and spending it and spending it, okay, you're, you're, you're going to have stress in your finances, okay? If you're always arguing with somebody, okay, you're going to have stress in your relationships. So there is a lot that the Bible talks about that we need to pay attention to in terms of maintaining the peace in our lives, yeah? 
the, 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 the veil has been torn, the way has been made, but this new life is a life that reflects the life of Jesus. If we don't live in that way, we're, we're going to continue in a peaceless life. These are some of the things that Ephesians chapter 4 says. Just some bullet points here. Be humble. Okay? Humility will lead to peace in our lives. Be gentle. Be patient. Be accepting. Be united in love. Okay? This is what the Bible, this is what Ephesians 4 tells us. Be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit. Being diligent means to be committed to it and to work hard for the unity of the Spirit. Chapter 4 continues in verses uh, 23 to 32. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Okay? Romans chapter 12 also talks about that. Be renewed in your mind. Okay? It will lead to peace. The more you're renewed, the more you're thinking thoughts the way that God thinks and the word of God, the more we'll have peace in our lives. Put on the new self. Okay? Some people become Christians and they try to live like the world. And that brings so much more stress because when they're in the world, they're thinking about being a Christian. When they're in a Christian, they're thinking about living the way of the world and they're, they're never happy. Okay, let's just all in. Let's just go all in to this new life. Let's just go all in. Put on the new self. Put away lying. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4. Put away lying. Stop doing that. Speak every one truth to your neighbor. Be angry. Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. That means when you do something stupid, apologize for it. Okay, when you do something out of anger, make it right. Care for the relationships that are around you. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't steal, but share. Don't use foul language, but instead build each other up. Don't grieve God's spirit. Be kind and compassionate. Forgive one another just like God forgave us. So this is just one chapter from one book in the Bible that teaches us some points of how to live, but how to maintain peace in our lives. If you want more peace, you want to maintain that peace within yourself, open up the Word of God and say, God, okay, teach me. Teach me. Give me one point that I can work on this week. Maybe it's stop arguing. Maybe it's submit. Maybe it's be a good steward with your finances. Okay? God has a plan for our lives. He wrote 66 books to tell us about that plan. Okay? It's a big plan. <laughs> but there's lots of good stuff in there for, for us. And if we open it and see and commit to saying, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust. I'm going to live life the way that you have planned out for me. And I'm going to choose peace. My final point, and it's a big one. Okay, We don't have a lot of time to go into it. But you want peace in your life? Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. God is a loving God, but he's also severe. He also judges and punishes. And we, sometimes we don't like talking about that stuff. We're like, oh, you know, I, how are people going to come to Jesus when we talk about the judgment of God? No, it's, it's true. There are consequences for our actions, and God forgives and God will welcome you back. But the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fearing God can keep you out of trouble. Maybe you're tempted to do something that you know you shouldn't. You stop and think, man, oh, what's going to happen if I do this? This could happen and that could happen. If you think it through. Uh -uh, no, I don't want that to happen. I don't want the consequences for this. 
Fear God. There's more about the fear of God in the Bible than there is the love of God. Fearing God. Living a life that is submitted to him, that's walking in his ways, that says, okay, God, I don't want to do this. Okay, let me tell you something about sin and temptation. We only sin and we're only tempted by stuff that's attractive to us. Okay? If you, like, hold out a bag of dog poop and say, here, Jason, eat this. And you're like, oh, I don't want that. That's not going to tempt me at all, right? Okay? But other things, we're always tempted by the stuff that's attractive to us. Okay? So our heart kind of sometimes goes after those things. And we have to tell ourselves no, and we have to submit to a higher authority. That's the fear of God. That's saying, God, my heart wants this, but I submit to you. And say, okay, God, I want to keep this togetherness. I want to stay close to you, and I know that this is going to interfere with that. So even though I might want this, I'm going to fear God. I'm going to say, God, all right, you are God, you are Lord. I don't want the consequences of this. Listen to what Psalms chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. There it is. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah, there's a lot packed into that one little phrase. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And trembling. It means respect God. Respect Him. Work it out, your salvation, with respect, with a holy awe of God, understanding that He's bigger than me. I'm just, I'm just here. I'm just a little person here on this world. God is so much better and bigger than me. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. He tells us to work it out with work it out with fear and trembling, but he also works in us. Let me read a few more verses that talk about the fear of God. Psalms chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. I read this to Angie this past week. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. <laughs> How many people have stood up here on a Sunday morning? Stand up here, lift up your hands, and, oh, God, rejoice with trembling. The Bible says, this is not me saying this. This is what the Bible says. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are, I love how the Psalms always brings it around at the end, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. 2 Corinthians says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So peace, peace is all, also about how we live and the choices that we make. And even though we're a Christian and, and walking with God and have relationship with him, sometimes we make choices that suck the fear out of our lives or su suck the, the, the peace out of our lives. God wants to say, okay, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk in it. God has a perfect plan for our lives. God has a great plan for our lives. But let's be people who promise to God, say each and every day, God, number one, I'm going to walk together with you. Okay? I'm going to stay together with God. Number two, I'm going to take care of my inside so that I can continue to travel on the road that God has for me. 
Number three, I'm going to find peace with God through obeying your word, through living in character, and living with a healthy fear of God. It's a good thing. Okay, it's not, it's not a bad thing. The Bible wouldn't talk about it. The Bible wouldn't encourage us to do it if it were a bad thing for us. It's a healthy thing. It's a good thing. It keeps us, it keeps us safe. And that's what God wants for us, to live in peace. Let's all stand up together. God's so good to us. He gives us his word. He gives us instruction. Let's be people of the word. Amen? Not just reading it, but people who do it. Like the Bible says, Jesus had that parable about the man who built his house on the rock. There was two guys in that story. First guy built his house on the sand. Second guy was the guy who built his house on the rock. Jesus said the second guy was the guy who hears the word of God. They both heard the word of God, but the man who built his house on the rock was the one who said, all right, I'm going to live my life by his word. Let's be people like that guy. Dig down to the rock, the word of God. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your constant love and your abiding presence. God, we are people who love you. We love your presence. We love worshiping you. But God, we don't want to just, we don't want to just say, my Christianity stops at the doors of the church. No, we want to people, be people who live it out each and every day. So God, today, we commit. I would like you guys to say after me. We're going to say a prayer of commitment. Not just saying to God, help me, but God, but saying to God, I commit to living life your ways. If you, if, if you would, I don't want you to say this if you don't mean it. But I'm going to lead us in a prayer of commitment to God. To living according to his way. To walking according to his word. So if you would... If, you, if Holy Spirit stirring you, say with me. Dear Heavenly Father, please say after me if you feel in your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I commit today to your word. I commit today to following you, to living together with you, to submit my life to your word, and to follow you to the best of my abilities. God, you promised. You promised a life of peace for all those who follow you. And I want to be that person. I commit to your word, to your ways, to your love, and to trusting you. Thank you for peace. Thank you for filling my life. Thank you that every day I walk together with you. And we walk this adventure in peace. Because of the blood of Jesus and the love of God. Amen. Amen. All right, bless you.